Welcome to The Screen Queen, the show where I'll be talking about your favorite TV show or your favorite movie. You'll just have to listen to find out. This is your host, Samantha Parrish. Hello there, and welcome back to the show. As always, I am your lean, mean, movie-talking machine, your screen queen, Samantha Parrish. So, Spirited Away is one of those movies that changed my life. I remember when Spirited Away came on when Cartoon Network did a Miyazaki month and they did Spirited Away and then Princess Mononoke and then Castle in the Sky and finished off with Nausicaa of the Valley and the Wind. And it was just like the best month of my 10 year old life. But above all those films that I do love and respect, Spirited Away is, well, my all-time favorite Studio Ghibli film. It was my introduction into another part of anime to see something that wasn't Yu Yu Hakusho, something that wasn't Dragon Ball Z, something that wasn't Sailor Moon. There's something about the Miyazaki films that just has a different vibe than the usual animes that we see. And most of that is due to the fact that the movies that he made were to please his children. When he became a dad, that forever changed the way he did animation and it really does show in all of his movies there is a way that you see these daring adventures these dark moments that's played very carefully and you get to have this maturity in a film that didn't feel like the films are biting off more than they can chew if you're familiar with like japanese anime or the movies or anything anime related on Toonami, Adult Swim, or Funimation then you know that Japan can go pretty dark with their content there are some things in anime that I am not able to unsee for how dark they can go. However, there are some animes that do handle a certain amount of dark themes or dark content with a level of maturity, and Miyazaki's always been a staple of handling dark content with maturity so that way kids can watch something and not feel scarred. Again, calling back to the fact that this guy changes animation because of the way he became a parent. I watched this movie every chance I got when I was a kid. My mom had recorded the latter half of it, and I watched that all the way through. I felt like that was the only time I was ever going to have spirited away in my life, to have this one gem that was unlike anything I've ever seen. And when my mom finally bought me the DVD, oh, pfft, I'm surprised that motherfucker wasn't broken. For how many times I watched it. I made my grandparents watch it with me and they even liked it despite not liking me getting so immersed in the media and then well here I am. <laughs> like That didn't change much but Spirit Away has such a special place in my heart. I have many more stories that I'm going to be sharing and I can't wait to get into it. So what a way to start anime August with Spirit It Away. So starting off the episode as always I don't know if much of my audience is familiar with anime, and I don't believe in leaving people in the dark if this is not really the bread of their butter in terms of what they watch. So I'm going to go ahead and give a little synopsis to what Spirited Away is. So this is here, this is going to be your Sammy synopsis, your Semopsis. Oh, that was clever. I'm kind of proud of myself for that. Anyway, Spirited Away follows a 10 year old girl named Chihiro who is not very content with life. She's moving to a new home. She doesn't have her friends. As far as she's concerned, life is over. Her parents decide to take a very strange detour on the way to their new home. And they end up going into a temple and Chihiro wants no part of it. She just wants to like get back to just her life being over. However, something strange happens to her parents as she has found that they've been turned into pigs and she has no way to get back to the real world. She's stuck in the spirit world. A young mysterious boy named Haku comes to her aid. She has no idea why he wants to help her and he has no idea why he wants to help her. It's like a very interesting little complexity you have going on in this film. And 
she's going to have to do whatever she can to survive as Haku gets her a job in the bathhouse in order to stay near her parents until she can figure out how to turn them back into humans. Chihiro's got her work cut out for her as she's going through one hell of a time to mature in her age. Like, she grew up pretty damn fast. With a character like Chihiro, it, it feels differently than the other children's films that we see where kids are going to be going through a, a learning phase in their life. I mean, this is not the way that kids are supposed to learn by having their parents cursed into pigs and having to work in a bathhouse. But... With the fact that Chihiro is so whiny, but she's understandably whiny. She's not coping with the changes. She doesn't like what's going on here. She's communicating why she doesn't like what's going on right now. It's hard to go through changes in life, but Chihiro does it in a way that really does feel genuinely real. So when you watch her go through all these things, you do root for her. You know that she's going to get through this, uh... She's got some amazing help with her side as she's learning new things about herself and finding strength that she never knew she had before. And I'll be going back into detail about the rest of the characters of Spirited Away, but I want to take a pause on that to talk about the English cast for Spirited Away. I've mentioned this many times that I find castings very interesting if it's done well. I mentioned that with Coco, which, you know, ironically, Coco and Spirited Away feel like a very strange parallel. But this cast does not get talked about enough, especially for some of the specific people that I would have never thought in a million years would have been in this movie. Still baffles me to this day. And it's not that hard to baffle me when it comes to movies, you know? So... Starting off the list, we gotta talk about our main character, Chihiro, voiced by Davy Chase. And if you don't know who that is, you'll definitely recognize her voice. Uh, she was Lilo from Lilo and Stitch. She was Samara from the first Ring movie. And honestly, I, I think that's about it. That's Oh wait, no, she was um, Samantha Darko from Donnie Darko. So she's had like... A lot to play specifically in horror movies or animation movies, which is kind of a cool pinnacle to be a part of, like, two of the major factors from the early 2000s. Like, those were, like, the main staples between Johnny Darko and Lilo and Stitch. And then Spirited Away is kind of like that one gem um, underneath all of them, which, you know, honestly should be above them. Because, to me, this is the best performance that Davy Chase has ever done. I love her. In Lilo and Stitch, she brought so much to Lilo, but we got a little bit more with her in Spirited Away. Like, she broke my heart to pieces in this film. I deeply related with the way that uh, she brought Chihiro to life on the screen. And uh, the next person on our list, uh, from what I see on IMDb, is uh, Suzanne Plachette, who is a actress that's been around for a very, very long time. This was near the end of her career, and what a hell of a way to go out. You always have, like, one old actor that has, like, an animated movie as, like, one of the final things they do before they die or retire, and this woman's been around a long time. She was Bob Newhart's wife on the Bob Newhart Show. Famously, she is known for the film The Birds, so there's always something around her with animals. We had it in The Birds, now we have it in Spirited Away. It feels like a nice bookend in a way differences that there actually no there was a she did play a bird i forgot that is actually kind of ironic that she voices a woman uh that is a sorceress in a way i don't know how to call you baba but she is definitely a magical being and she does transform into like this big giant bird thing and she does have a bird thing henchman i don't know whatever you want to call it so birds is kind of symbolized with her i wonder if the birds was mentioned while she was voicing uh, Yubaba because, like, how can you not? It's such an interesting connection. But, wow, that was cool to, like, think of that on the spot. Next up on the list is a guy named Jason Marsden. And you might not know the name, but you'll definitely know what he's been. And you have probably seen this man and didn't even realize it. I mean, just on top of the list, he was in Boy Meets World, where he played, I guess, a fictional version of himself. 
I didn't know this until just now and I was reading it that he was the voice of Max Goof from a Goofy movie. And he was on Full House playing J uh, Nelson Burkhard, the best boyfriend that DJ Tanner ever had, in my opinion. And, best for last, Thackeray Binks on Hocus Pocus. I mean, pff, amazing. This guy's been like a major part of the 90s. And he is still doing voice acting. Uh, from what I read, he was the voice of Dick Grayson in one of the Batman movies, uh, Transformers. I'm seeing some Young Justice here, The Lion Guard. Like, I could keep going and going. This man is no stranger to voice acting after he started to do it more primarily. But the way he played Haku, even though I'm not very familiar with the majority of the rest of his acting credits besides a Goofy movie, the way he played Haku still lived with me. From what I remember about this actor and the way that he plays characters is that he was very specific on how he gave layers to some certain characters. He always gave a lot of vulnerability. I remember the vulnerability he gave to Nelson when he played DJ's boyfriend on Full House and remembering him from Full House kind of helped me watch the movie again after knowing his name and saying, wow, this guy was meant to play Haku. They couldn't have chosen a better actor. I wish he was known for Spirited Away, but unfortunately I'm not in charge of that yet. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe things could change. Let's see. Who else is on the list? Next up is a woman named Susan Egan, who you might not know, but once you hear her, you're going to be like, I've heard this woman before. And I remember feeling that when I was a child, like, I, I know I've, I've heard her before. Like, Davy Chase was another one that I'm like, it's there. But it's remembered but it's remembered very distantly for a reason. Susan Egan was the voice of Meg on Hercules. And when I found that out, I was like, oh my god, that makes so much sense. I can hear Meg. It like stuck out to me. And this woman has done some amazing stuff. She uh, voiced Rose Quartz on Steven Universe. She's been in The Simpsons, Amphibia. Like she's no stranger to voice acting but it's cool that spirited away got to be one of the things that she got to do like it's one of the best ones that she's done there's so much sass into lynn's character anytime i watch this movie with my friend um, emily that's the first thing we talk about is lynn like we just love her sassiness and we always have to mention like oh there's meg from hercules so next up on the list is another familiar disney actor one of our Dearly Departed Actors, David Og Ogden Steers. So with this man, you could throw a dart and find a character that he voiced in Disney. He, on top of my head, Governor Ratcliffe from Pocahontas. He was one of the characters in The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Uh, and he was Jumbo Jukiba from Lilo and Stitch. And I mentioned earlier, Davy Chase was Lilo from Lilo and Stitch. This movie came out in 2001, which kind of marked the first time they worked together before they went on to go do Lilo and Stitch. It's kind of a cool little hand-in-hand -hand collaboration before, in kind of a strange way, still playing sort of the same characters where Davy Chase still voiced a, a, a lost little girl and David Godgan Steers plays like a character that eventually warms your heart. It's kind of an interesting parallel, and it could have been easy to make a typecast, but Davy Chase and David Godgan Steers like bring so much to it that I literally don't see a difference. It just feels genuine and real. And uh, finishing this off with a couple more people, we have Lauren Holly, who plays Chihiro's mother. And that threw me for a loop because my family loves NCIS and I got to be like, hey, someone from your show is in my movie. And my mom's like, oh, that's a voice. So I'm like, yeah, a voice that you like. Give me some credit, mom. <laughs> anyway, I, I was so shocked to find out that Lauren Holly did some voice acting because she's always done crime shows for like a majority of her career and for a majority of the stuff that I've seen. So I was like, wow, Lauren Holly, that's pretty cool. And the next one, and in my opinion, the most shocking casting that I have seen in quite some time, and when I found this out, I was just like, never able to live it down, Michael Chiklis voices Chihiro's father, and that, like, 
I couldn't believe it because from what I've seen from Michael Chiklis, I've always known him as a villain, an anti-hero, a cop. I have never seen him play something under a very outrageous performance. I always hear like this anger, this hostility, and to not hear any of that present just threw me off my radar. Even when I started to understand more of like catching on to certain voices, like that just went over my head completely. It wasn't until one day I was going through the voice cast of Spirited Away and when I was starting to recognize some of the actors after I got familiar with other actors and actresses, seeing uh, Michael Chiklis pop up, I was just like, really? And it's like, it's not a bad performance. It's an underrated performance, in my opinion, for the fact that he played a dad. He just played a normal guy, which is rare because, you know, Michael Chiklis is not a normal guy. And... Uh, it's interesting to see him play a character that is just kind of in the background. He's just kind of there. He's the father, but he does bring a lot of charm. He brings so much to this character that you don't get to spend so much time with, which is pretty cool. Despite the fact that he's just Chihiro's father, he, he does a pretty good job being Chihiro's father. So we're almost done. I got one more left. Thank you for being troopers and having to endure the cast list, but I can't not mention this last one. Because Hayao Miyazaki's films had a big help from Disney, like, getting in there, you know one of the other Disney dudes is going to be in there, specifically one of John Lasseter's dudes, specifically one of the dudes that always has a cameo and has played in every single Pixar film. I'm talking about John Ratzenberger. When I was watching the behind the scenes for the making of Spirited Away and the whole association with... Uh, Disney and John Ratzenberger getting to play one of the characters in there. It is one of the best. Like, I love him in Pixar, don't get me wrong, but he has a little bit more room to work with in this character because of the way that things transpired and spirited away. Like, this is kind of a minor spoiler alert, but he plays a character that's one of the workers for the bathhouse and does the song that I'm not going to sing because I feel like I can't do it justice because John Ratzenberger did such a great job with it, but here you go. Knowing that, I was like, yep, that's Don Ratzenberger. It's such a, it's a funny way to make basically a kiss-ass song. But it's the best kiss-ass song that, you know, a lot of kids remember. The best thing that kind of makes it funny. And John Ratzenberger was probably the only one that could do that. But there's a part in the film where his character gets eaten by another character named No-Face. And No-Face doesn't really have a voice. So he kind of bounces off of the people that he's eaten and with John Ratzenberger's character being in there, his voice is being used. Kind of like a like a ventriloquist puppet-like thing, but you know, like reverse it if the ventriloquist was like in the um in the puppet. As much as I love all the cameos he's done, this is like one of the roles that I love that he got to do where it's more than just a cameo. So now that I'm done talking about the cast for the characters, now I can finally get back to talking about the characters. So I've talked a little bit about Chihiro's characterization at the beginning of the episode. So what I want to do is I'd like to make a bit of a double hitter and talk about Chihiro and Haku. When I look at these two characters, I see so much strength between the two of them. Even though the whole point of Spirited Away is that Chihiro is doing everything in her power to get her parents back. Haku plays a major part of that. He plays more than just the part of someone that is going to help Chihiro, that something is going to turn around, that Chihiro is going to help him. There's some way that these two are going to help each other in their own arcs. And we see this beautiful, cultivated dynamic between the two of them. It really does go hand in hand with the way you see these characters. Shihiro is very impatient. Haku is very patient and in a way that kind of complements each other for the way that you do see Chihiro build herself up in the film. 
there's also something with Haku where there's moments to his character that he feels like he's being controlled. Like there's something else going on there, but you don't quite know yet because he'll flip so quickly. There's a part in the film that's revealed where the character Kamaji says that Haku hasn't had it good since he got here, that ever since Yubaba uh, took him on as an apprentice, that Haku had just changed, went like cold, steely, just like completely just shut down. Yet when Shahira comes in the picture, he, you know, his eyes get bright. He's just like, his voice goes up a couple of octaves. There's a um, familiarity as well as some kind of a comfort that he has being around Shahira, even though he doesn't know yet. He even says in the film that he doesn't know why he knows her name. He said that he remembers when she was very little. But he doesn't know why he remembers her. He doesn't know why he knows her name. He doesn't even remember his own name, yet he just knows her. Something is so strong in that bond, despite both of these characters respectively being in the dark, that somehow they're both able to illuminate the answers that, he, that the other is looking for. And in a way, Haku is a major part with Chihiro's maturity. There is a part near the middle marker of the film that really does solidify how much Chihiro has grown in the two to three days that she's been in the bathhouse. That she went from this girl that was scared to go down the stairs, she was screaming at everything, she just panicky, flighty, everything, and yet when Haku comes back to the bathhouse and he is being attacked by paper cranes, I imagine it's got to be a paper cut from hell, and... She sees him go into Yubaba's office and she knows, I gotta go to Haku. She does not hesitate to go through crowds, uh, have to find her, flight her way around people. And even like running across pipes, going up ladders. She doesn't say a peep. She doesn't whine. All she says is, I have to get here. I need to get here. She's putting her foot down. She's finding strength she never had because someone she loves, their life is on the line. This is a person that went out of his way to help her out and she has to go help him out too. It's a wonderful thing to see the characterization in Chihiro's maturity where she just does it in the snap. You never know when ambition is going to hit you. And that's a wonderful example to see it in there. But with the way that Chihiro helps Haku, it's wonderful to see the ways that Haku has helped Chihiro. We've known that he's willing to do it, but we actually get a solid moment with Haku where he's going out of his way to make sure Chihiro is not getting screwed in her end of the deal. All Chihiro had to do was stay in the bathhouse, do her work, and then somehow, some way, get her parents back. After Chihiro leaves to go resolve one last issue for Haku, this changes everything. This changes the whole dynamic of the plot of what we see that it went from Chihiro uh, doing everything she could to find her parents that she still needs to get this done for Haku. And Haku knows Chihiro has gone on a limb for him, has done the ultimate deed for him, and he makes a stance to Yubaba. There's a part in the film where she is stark raving mad about where her son could be, not knowing her son is with Chihiro because Yubaba's been blind to a lot of stuff going on. And then there's Haku that kind of has all the answers but knows how to play the game now with Yubaba. And she charges at him, fire is coming out of her mouth, and you know, oh my god, what's going to happen to Haku? And he just stands there, like, still as a board, unfazed, unafraid, We've never actually seen Yubaba and Haku have, like, a solid conversation. It's usually mostly mute or go do this, go do that. And now we know this is a different stance. This is different than what we've never seen before, but we've known the nature of their relationship. And to me, when I look at that scene with Haku, is that he's doing this for Chihiro. Because Chihiro went out of her way to go resolve one last issue that isn't really hers. And then here's Haku doing everything he can to make sure that Chihiro has parents when she comes back. They are like solid friends. To, to see them do whatever they can for each other, that is such a wonderful act of love right there for what you're willing to do to put your own, your values to the side to put someone else's values 
uh, first. Looking on this film and all of its characters, there aren't really any villains in this movie. We have Yubaba, that's a sorceress, and she's just kind of doing things for her own game, but she's not really malicious. Like, she does care about her big-ass fucking baby. I can't even eat some Wheaties, but... She's not really a, a bad character. She's just doing things for an amusement. That's kind of like what sorceresses do. Again, I don't know for certain if she's a sorceress, a witch, just a magical being, whatever it is that makes her otherworldly. She's not really bad. Like, even in the end of the film, she's upheld her under the bargain. She let Chihiro's parents go. Like, she could have just smited them. She, she could have been like the bad guy character, but that's the wonderful thing about Hayao Miyazaki's characters is that all of the uh, like characters that were a little bit sketchy get redeemed in the best way possible, or they're just kind of there, and that's okay. They can still be mischievous, but they're not going to be malicious. Um, another one that's also been like a central figure in the movie that ironically became the most marketable is the character No Face. Thinking about No Face, I, you know, I, I think I almost hurt my brain having to think about him for the fact that there are elevated moments with this character. When we're first introduced to No Face, uh, he comes into the bathhouse after Chihiro let him in, and uh, there's a very, there's like a childlike demeanor in a way with No Face that he's kind of naive to some certain things. He tries to get all these bath tokens for Chihiro knowing she needs them because of like, oh, this little girl let me in the bathhouse and I want to repay her. But unfortunately, like, Chihiro just explains, oh, I don't need that much. And he's like, oh, I did bad. And then like disappears and they all drop. And it's like, well, shit. He's, he's kind of hard to take some social cues sometimes because he's been alone all of his life. But shit hits the fan pretty quick when... um. No Face ends up eating some of the people. After he can make gold, he's, like, worshipped and celebrated, but, like, once something bad happens, he just flips very quickly. He's kind of an unstable character. Uh, when he presents this big pile of gold right in front of Chihiro, like, all the wealth right there, and she said, no, I have to go help my friend. And, like, that selflessness we see with Chihiro... And No Face can't understand that. Like, even though it's virtually a kindness onto a kindness, but it's different directions of kindness. And unfortunately, No Face's kindness takes a turn where he comes unstable, and Chihiro's kindness takes a turn where she's becoming more uh, selfless and trying to go help Haku during the critical part of the film. And that really ties everything together on your mile marker for how things have changed with how all these characters divulge into their own paths. And with no face, oh, it takes a dark-ass turn. A little bit scary, and, you know, Hayao Miyazaki handled it with grace and care with the character no face when he becomes a threatening figure in the bathhouse that he just wants to keep eating and eating and eating. If you look at no Face's character, nothing satisfies him because he's so unhappy. That can be a huge thing to how a lot of people deal with depression that, like, you can eat and buy things, but it doesn't fill an empty void when you're unhappy with yourself. And No Face is kind of a representation of like what that feeling feels like to be so insatiable when unhappiness is just this void. And looking at it, like I'm, it's an interesting way they have presented No Face as this character that does get redeemed. It could have been easy to write him off as a monster, but there's so many things you can take away with No Face. Again, there are no wrong answers in this movie when you look at it. So there's one more little snippet I have about Yubaba. So I don't know if anyone has ever thought about this with Yubaba's character, but even though the amazing and dearly missed Suzanne Plachette had um, voiced two characters that both look the same. They're identical twins, Yubaba and Zaniba, that when I watched the introduction of Zaniba, I truly felt like that was a different character, despite voiced being by the same person, despite looking exactly the same. 
I really felt that was a completely different character, just with the way that uh, Zaniba comes across. And it mostly has to do with the environment that Zaniba lives in. When we see Yubaba's uh, penthouse in the bathhouse, like she has everything. She's never satisfied. She wants more. Kind of a weird, like foil to no face that is uh, unhappy because of not feeling sufficient, not feeling satisfied, like needing things. And well, you know, teach his own. But look at Zaniba. Zaniba doesn't need much. She just has a little flower. She's got a little table. She's got like she cooks for herself. She's she's got magic. She doesn't if she needs something, she'll go provide it for herself. She's good at self sufficiency, which brings me to a point I want to kind of say in this uh, character talk is is spirited away kind of about sufficiency. Now there's no concrete topic or reason or theme for the film, but I've run into that a lot when I've watched this film about sufficiency. Like, Chihiro has to find a way to be sufficient for herself because of the fact that she's been thrown into this world and she's got to figure things out and understand, like, this is what it is. And she matures and she really is able to handle life better. And Haku was looking for sufficiency, too. And so when he said he didn't have anything, he just went along with it and, boom, got to be taken prisoner by Yubaba from a spell. And then, of course, I mentioned Yubaba. Like, she material girl in a material spirit world and no face who needs things because of unhappiness and then there's Zaniba. Like you, you kind of see what I mean here. I don't know if I'm right I'm, and I'm okay with being wrong but that's just something I kind of happen to think of when Zaniba's character comes into play. It makes me think about the other characters that I've seen so far. It's just it happened to come to mind. Just wanted to kind of breach that into this as a little tangent side topic within the topic. But when I watch Zaniba, I just, the entire time that she's on screen, I just, it never threw me for a loop that I was looking at Yubaba, despite looking exactly like Yubaba. And that's a wonderful thing that Suzanne Plachette gave to the character, as well as the writing behind Yubaba and Zaniba to look at two people that look identical, but on the inside, they're not. Like, on their heart and their mind, everything. And... Zaniba just feels like a breath of fresh air. Again, like that palate cleanser that we need in this film when after we've gone through such dark stuff that's occurred. And with Zaniba being in the film, it kind of feels like the perfect, one of the perfect endings to this film that No Face has found a place to be. That's kind of a funny word on play, No Face found his place, when he ends up living with Zaniba, who I would mentioned <clears throat> is unhappy. And he kind of found this like sufficiency in life and he can kind of learn through Zaniba. That's kind of a cool thing that we know is going to happen when everything is said and done. Zaniba just kind of feels like a character for all characters or like how we, um, we look at Ariel from The Little Mermaid about how she hypes everyone up, even though we don't really know too much about Ariel. Same thing with Zaniba. We know she's a twin sister and she's self-sufficient, but she just helps Chihiro. She notices no face needs a place to stay and is willing to help him out kind of like a you know helping the wandering souls being wonderful to her big ass baby nephew that's a mouse <laughs> it's, it's amazing how much her kindness just like just emphasizes and uh just radiates through the film it's amazing there's something that i was thinking about in regards to why spirited away has these very special moments is the silent moments. The things I remember the most about this film are the moments where the characters don't talk and they just interact with each other, which to me really makes a strong film where you don't have to have anything be said at all. You have the actions speak for themselves. And one of the scenes I'm going to talk about, it's a continuation of what I mentioned earlier with Haku and Shihiro's interactions with each other when he takes her to go see her parents and when uh, when Shihiro finds out her name was taken and he gives her her name back and helps her remember her name and tells her she can't lose it and he uh, gets her some food to help replenish her energy and help her get through this environment that everything's, everything is going to be okay and this moment just like this shocked me as a very mature moment when 
I was a kid where Chihiro is eating these, like, I guess the rice balls, and she just begins just, like, big giant globs of anime tears just come down her face, and she just sobs from exhaustion. Like, it, like, the pressure's really getting onto her, and it's a nice moment, like, early example to see to just break down and get it out of the way, that nothing doesn't have to be said, even though some things are said, but the way that he just, like, puts his arm around her and just says, you'll be okay, have some more. Like, it's gonna work out on its own. You don't know how it's gonna happen yet, but you know with the trust you have in Haku and the way that Chihiro has taken care of that she's gonna be okay. It's a nice comforting moment to have in a film that already had very dark moments. It felt like a giant palate cleanser we all needed before we digest more darker moments of the film. Just That's just me personally looking at that when I remember watching as a child and thinking about that as an adult. There's another scene that I love that I feel just speaks volumes by itself and it's just the pacing of it still stuck with me. And it's the scene right after the one that we just saw with Chihiro just processing everything going on and just having a little bit of a some time in her emotions. Now it's a lot for a 10 year old of what she's going through and it's a major factor for her. But the thing I love is right after that scene where we cut to Kamaji and he's just waking up to get a little drink of water and he like stops and you hear a little like surprise noise from him and we hold on Kamaji for just a moment longer just to like have the scene stretched out for the amount of sentiment that it needs. It's one thing I love about Spirit Away is it knows how to hold on the sentiment without holding too long or cutting it off where we can't have enough time with it. And we immediately see what he's seeing, which is Chihiro just kind of curled in on herself after you know, just a little post-breakdown nap. And all the sut sprites are staring at her. And it's such a wonderful little calm sentiment moment where she's getting acclimated to this life that's going to be hers for just maybe a, a day or two more. And Kamaji just kind of stops for a moment, processes it, and then he uses his long-ass Mr. Fantastic arms to take a little nearby pillow to place on top of her. Like, it's such a silent moment that speaks the volume for the fact that he understands this is a lost little girl that doesn't belong here. But everyone is doing what they can to help her acclimate. She just wants to get her parents. It's a little moment that you know everyone's kind of rooting for her. So the world that Hayao Miyazaki makes for us is absolutely amazing. Like... You can't unsee anything in this film. It lives in your mind. Everything looks like a Thomas Kincaid photo, but Thomas Kincaid wishes that this that all this animation was on the same level of Thomas Kincaid. Like it's breathtakingly beautiful. But there's one part of the film that has a real life connection. There is a quote unquote famous story that Hayao Miyazaki shared that happened to him when he was younger. Uh, during the scene in the film where the river spirit is being cleansed back when he was a stink spirit and one of the things that's pulled out of the spirit is a bicycle. When Hayao Miyazaki was younger he had participated in the cleaning of a river and they were pulling out a whole bunch of random things one of which was a bicycle. And that stuck with him to the point that he had to make that a reference in the film of that part of his life where everyone came together to clean the river. Just like in the film, everyone came together to clean the river spirit. What a giant parallel. Like, it feels like the same story, even though there's a major element of supernatural uh, enchantment behind it. Still, that's a pretty cool little parallel just to have a story from his life be in the film in a different way. And there's one other real-life element that goes into the film, and it has to do with the main character, Chihiro. If memory serves, I remember, and if I'm wrong, I'll put a little note in the description box, that Chihiro is based off of one of Hayao Miyazaki's children's friends. That I mentioned earlier in the film that the whole reason his filmmaking changed was when he became a parent. And a lot of the elements around his children like made its way into the film. And there was a friend of their children's. I hope they're still tight because that's an amazing element. Like, wow, hi, I'm the friend of Hayao Miyazaki's children that I was based off of. It was me. Anyway, I had to get that on my system. 
uh, she was the inspiration behind Chihiro that Hayao Miyazaki had said that she had this perfect pouty face, like the perfect kind of 10 year old, like, uh, just immature pouty face that just seemed to be perfect for a character like Chihiro. Like it captured that perfect essence that he needed to make this character of our heroine having to go through a major life change and jump some hurdles and going into maturity in a very unlikely way. It's, it's kind of cool that it all like stems from that. But with all these elements in the film, it's no wonder it's still regarded as one of the best animated films. You'd be so surprised how much success this film made. This is the first anime film to ever gross more than $200 million in the U.S. Let me see, here's some other stuff. It was the highest rated film, the highest rated animated film on Letterboxd. It's ranked 37 in non-English speaking film and critics poll conducted by the BBC in 2018. Like even every year as we're getting more animated films, Spirited Away still stands the test of time. It was the second animated film to be the winner of the Academy Award for Best Animated Feature, the first being Shrek. Like look at that, a non-Disney film won an Academy Award and another one that had some help from Disney, just a little bit of help without taking like Disney credit had also been featured. Like, that's kind of cool. Two non-Disney films that were able to win an Academy Award. Um, this was also the first Studio Ghibli film produced in full digital process with DLP technology. I don't know if that means anything to anybody, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of firsts here. This was the highest grossing film in Japanese history before being surpassed by Demon Slayer, the movie Mugen Train in 2020. For 19 years, this was top dog in Japan. But in the US, it still became the first like Japanese film to ever gross, gross so much money. It's just amazing how many firsts this film has made, as well as the lasting legacy that it's had. And even to this day, as I'm talking, there's no way Spirited Away can't exist in society. Now that people are becoming more open to anime, I go into Hot Topic and I see more Spirited Away stuff, and I'm like, where were you when I was 12? <laughs> and it's so cool to see how this film is being celebrated. Like, Kiki is also celebrated. Um, Howl's Moving Castle, same thing too, but Spirited Away, though, that's just such a different note that just can't be done. It's a certain specific tune that exists on its own. It can't be replicated. It's a beautiful thing that exists with us. There's so many things in here that it is a fantastical fantasy film, but the real life moments really do hit home. When you watch Chihiro mature, when you get to watch Haku get to get his memories back, when you watch everyone in the boiler room uh, come together, when you watch the, the bathhouse people mingle together, it's such a fantastical world to get involved in, but it's also a world you know you're going to have to say goodbye to. It's like I mentioned in my episode about Ghost, like, when I watch that movie, every time I'm, like, feeling it getting near, I'm like, oh my god, I have to say goodbye to these people. I want to stay here forever. It's the same thing with Spirited Away. You want to stay there forever. I mean, it's not a great life. I mean, for fuck's sake, Chiro's parents get turned into pigs. It's not too great. But knowing the outcome, you still want to sit with these characters that you've gotten to know so well. So... There's something that's been a staple of Hayao Miyazaki's movies is uh, pigs. He had a main pig character named Porco Rosso, and there's always been a mention of a pig in different films. I don't know what this man has to do to hog the attention with pigs, but okay. You know, teach his own. Everyone's got their own. You know, Stephen King's got Dairy Maine. Hayao Miyazaki's got pigs. But I don't know if this has ever been discussed or discovered, like, how dark that pig element goes. Like, when we see Chihiro's parents with the pigs, like, it's great that she recognizes the the parents that she knows despite looking like every other pig. But here's my question. Uh, what about the others? I'm. It's never really been officially clarified that the other pigs are indeed other 
uh, travelers that like got trapped there became pigs, and you know what happens to pigs, you know, we got there's some free meat right there. Oh my god, it's a whole new term on long pig. Oh my lord, but uh, it's kind of dark. Like, I'm glad Shihiro got her parents back, but um, what about the others? Shihiro's parents aren't the only ones that's ever happened to, and it has been mentioned that it always happens to humans that like wander into their world, but uh. It's a little bleak now looking at the ending going, you got your parents back. Sorry about the other guys. Oh, well, I guess there's no 10 year old child that's going to come back for them. I don't know. It's a little bit dark, but, um, then again, the, like the film couldn't cram too much in there. Like they kind of gave us as much as we needed. Now, the ending of Spirited Away is something that I do love where we don't really know what's going to happen next. We know Haku is free. We know that Chihiro's gonna be okay. She's She's got a better handle on life in one of the weirdest ways possible, but it's like you, you're okay with the promise of knowing that Haku and Chihiro are gonna see each other again, and then she goes to find her parents that woke up, and they probably are wondering, like, what the hell happened? It's, they're gonna have the strangest loss of time for the rest of their lives. And when Chihiro and her parents make it back out and she looks back to the tunnel and wonders like what's going to happen and again we hold on that knowing Chihiro is a changed child for the better in a way she can now handle anything that life has to tackle her but it does make me wonder about this if there's ever any moment in Chihiro's life that her parents say something along the lines of like well we do everything for you and she's like listen here you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for me. I was getting chased by by, by spirits. I, I had to clean a stink spirit. I almost got chased by something called No Face. I was on a dragon. Like, I did so much while you guys were sleeping in a pig pen. And they're like, what? And she's like, exactly. <laughs> so sorry, I could not resist that joke. This is what happens when you're on the show. You get too many jokes layered into things. But wow, man. What a hell of a movie. There's so many great things about it. And I'm glad that it got to be one of my very first Tayo Miyazaki films. I'm glad this was my intro and it really changed the way that I tell stories. It changed the way I look at stories now. It's a film that really does have a great maturing factor that you can watch at any age and just feel like you kind of grew up a little bit more, but that you also got to have that feeling of being a child again. It's such a wonderful film to just get into and just literally get spirited away with it. And that is officially a wrap on the Spirited Away episode for the anime series on the Screen Queen. This was really amazing to go down memory lane and think about the scenes I watched when I was younger and still feeling the same way I did when I was 10 years old watching this film and how much it changed me, the way I look at storytelling, the way that I, uh, I went through life. Like, Spirited Away had a major part of my life when... This film helped me get through that. Everyone has their film that helps them get through life and Spirited Away was that for me. It helped me through a lot of times of my youth where I was feeling very lost. I say youth like I'm so old, like I'm Yubaba or something. Oh my goodness. Anyway, let's find out what our next episode's gonna be on the screen queen for the anime series. Okay. Alrighty. So you know the drill. I got a whole bunch of random selections in a box and I don't know what it's gonna be. Neither do you. Let's do this together. Okay. Here we go. Let's shake it up. Alrighty. Let's see what we got here. Okay. I think that's enough shaking. I'm too tired. Here we go. What are you? Speak to me. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Wow. So the, this one I hold in my hand, it's a little bit obscure, but oh, I feel like it's so underrated that it needs to be talked about. Alrighty. So here we go. The next episode on the screen, Queen, for the anime series is going to be Nabari no O. I'm sure there's a lot of people that are just like, uh, no, what? What are you talking about? What? What are you talking about? Well, we're going to find, you'll, you'll find out in the next episode, okay? Just wait in anticipation. But if you can't wait in anticipation, if you just need to have more information, you can find me on my Instagram at the Queen of the Screen for more movie content, TV content. If you just want to say hi, shoot me a recommendation. 
Um, if you would like to see some funny movie related stuff I put up on TikTok, you can find me at The Mystical Space Witch. And if you would like to check out my book series in Glorious Inc., you can find it in the description box and on Amazon. Either way, both works. Alrighty, you all take care now. Stay safe, stay cool. I am just trying to get through this summer. I'm starting to feel like the Wicked Witch of the West and I'm just melting every time I get outside, but that's, that's summer for you. Anyway, you all take care. Stay amazing. This is your screen queen signing off. Bye-bye.